What is up, everybody? Welcome back to the Geek Pantheon. I am Eric, and today we are talking about rivals. When you want to introduce NPCs that particularly form kind of a party and go parallel with the player characters on adventures, and the players can develop a friendly rivalry all the way to like a hostile kind of enemies on the same path kind of relationship. And if this sounds familiar, why yes, Call of the Nether Deep by Wizards of the Coast did come out today. And I did a review of this book you can find on the channel. I'll put a link up there so that you can go check that out. First off, thank you to Wizards of the Coast for sending me a copy of the book. Obviously my review and this video are being recorded before the book releases. And I couldn't do that kind of stuff without them sending me the book to do this kind of stuff. So thank you. And let's get into it. So I'm going to be discussing a lot of this in the confines of Call of the Netherdeep, but my intention is for all this to be applicable to any game that you are running. If you want to introduce NPCs in a similar manner with which they introduce them in Call of the Netherdeep. So let's talk about how they initially introduce rivals in Call of the Netherdeep. So in the opening adventure, the party are introduced to each of these individual rival NPCs but they have already formed a party. They're just in different places and there's different interactions that you can have with them. And I think that's a really important thing to have if you're doing a rival NPC kind of setup is making sure that they are along for the ride at every step of the way. I imagine it would be slightly more difficult to pull this off if you introduce them halfway through an adventure or a campaign. It's just gonna have more weight and be more impactful if you introduce them from the get go. And then what the adventure does really good is it establishes these rival NPCs, gives you a backstory, what they want, their goals, and then sets up different milestone moments where based on how the party has been treating these NPCs, they respond differently at these big milestones, whether the rival party is hostile, indifferent, or friendly. And that can be a really cool way to have the players feel like they're having an impact on the world and an impact on their relationship with these characters. And that's really all you kind of get from the adventure. And there is more to be done, I guess, for lack of a better way to put it. There's a lot more to do with the concept of rival NPCs that I'm going to get into, whether you're running Call of the Netherdeep or just using this as a a tool in any game that you may be running. So first and foremost, looking at the rival NPCs and their introduction in the book, this is in the intro of Call of the Netherdeep, you have these little blurbs that are literally everything that you need to know to run these characters. And I'm not kidding when I say that. They're broken up into really easy, where did they come from? Who are they now? What do they want? Past, present, future. So by taking that formula and applying it to any NPC that you're creating, you can really give yourself a full picture with which to run them in an engaging way and then allow their interactions with the party to inform the rest of it. And then on this page, you just have each of their goals. So what is driving them? Why are they adventurers? Which is something that your players should also be answering in their backstories. But that's not what this video is for. For rival NPCs, answer the question, why are they adventurers? What do they want? What's their ambition? So that that can inform their engagements with the party. And as it's presented in the book, basically a party member can be in one of three standings with a rival NPC, friendly, indifferent, or hostile. And you use that to inform the attitude of the entire party when it comes to the player character's party but you have essentially 25 data points to go off of to figure this out because you have five and five as it's written in Call of the Nether Deep. Obviously, if you have more PCs, you should create more rivals, fewer PCs, you should run fewer rivals. One-to-one -one, I think is a good formula because it's going to allow there to be enough NPCs for every party member to feel like there's somebody they can have a meaningful reaction with and it's not gonna be so many NPCs that you feel overwhelmed because there would be the impulse to create a lot of NPCs. And so then the party can pick who they want to interact with, but that's just more work for yourself. And I wouldn't do that. I would just one-to-one. -one, and then if there's one rival NPC that multiple party members wanna interact with, they can do that because just like real people, when you develop friendships and interact, you're gonna act a little bit differently based on the person that you're interacting with. And so if if the rival NPC is talking to two different party members at two different points, they might have a slightly different 
personality and the way that they talk and respond based on the personality of the player character that they're interacting with. But there is another option if you are running Call of the Netherdeep or just using this system in any game. And that comes from another book, Strixhaven. And they have the relationship points system that was introduced in this book, as well as bond boons and bond banes if you get to plus two or negative two. And I feel like that adds a bit more nuance than just three different points at which relationship can be expanding that to five with plus two, plus one, zero, minus one, minus two. And having that numerical factor, obviously you could transcribe it to be numerical with how it is in Call of the Netherdeep, but by having just an on the face numerical value, then you could just do math to figure out how each rival NPC feels about each party member, uh, how the whole rival party feels about each party member, and then how the whole rival party feels about the player party. And by just doing the math and figuring out, okay, so if you're doing all the way up to plus two or negative two, and you're doing all the data points that you can get up to plus 50 down to negative 50. And so if it's zero to 25, then it's a positive relationship, but not like super close. And then if it's 25 to 50, then they're, they feel really close to the player party and same with negative 25 and then negative 50. So you can add a bit more nuance that way. So that's just an option to pull from Strixhaven. And then even if you wanted to, so if you look at the fellow students that are introduced in Strixhaven, it follows a very similar, but not quite the same. I like the NPC backgrounds in Call of the Netherdeep much more than uh, Strixhaven, but that's primarily because Strixhaven relates to uh, what they do in school and like what clubs they belong to, not quite how are they adventurers? But one thing I do like are the bond boons and bond banes down here at the bottom. And if you are really close or really hostile to one of these uh, NPCs, then you have different things happening. And I think that could work in Call of the Netherdeep because you spend a lot of time in cities. Two of the seven chapters that take place in this book, you're in cities doing stuff and you're especially chapter four you're in that city for weeks and so there are plenty of opportunities for boons and banes to come into play based on your relationship with each npc so that's just one thing that i would do potentially is take the relationship point system and marry it with the rival system. But in addition to that, if you are taking a more nuanced approach to the rival system, so each time that you get to a big milestone moment in this book, like at the end of chapter three here, and I'm not gonna get into spoilers for the adventure, so don't worry, I'm not gonna ruin any story beats. But at the end of chapter three, the rival NPCs cross paths with the player characters once again. This is not the first time. And basically there are three different options on how they respond based on friendly, indifferent, or hostile. And they are fairly different. The friendly response is much different than the indifferent versus hostile. And so basically what that means is that you are kind of, you're taking this really interesting thing where every party member can have a different unique relationship with every member of the rival PC to where you have these 25 different data points. But then when it comes time to actually, you know, put it in action, it becomes very generic. It becomes very like figure out the average and then they all work together. And this comes down really to how as a DM, you and your players want the game to treat the player characters. If the way your campaigns go is the player characters are the center of the story, the world lives and breathes based on the actions of the player characters, then sure. Taking these NPCs and reducing the interactions that the players have had with them down to kind of an aggregate, like the average is friendly. So we are all friendly to you. Then I'm sure that's fine. Your players aren't gonna mind that. You aren't gonna mind that. You can move on. But if your game worlds tend to exist outside of the scope of the player characters and the world moves on and NPCs do things when the player characters aren't around and the villains are constantly on the move, then it can come across a little disingenuous that if you have this really deep, meaningful relationship with an NPC and then them and their friends show up, but because your fellow party members haven't been putting in the work, then this person that you might even call like a best friend, all of a sudden is like, sorry, 
the math says I'm indifferent towards you right now, so I'm going to be indifferent. Then that can be a huge letdown for a player that cares about role playing and social interactions and character stories and things like that. Me, it would be a letdown to me. <laughs> so, um, what I would do running it and what I would like to see if it were being run for me is conflict within the rival NPC party, not to where they start attacking each other yet, but just like the player characters don't always agree on their opinions of NPCs, the NPCs don't have to agree on their opinions of the non-player characters and can react accordingly. I know for a fact that I have existed in multiple parties as a player where the decision about whether or not we were going to kill somebody was totally not decided during the combat encounter. You have like I I have been in combat encounters where one player character has been trying to kill an enemy and then like another player will cast spare the dying or a healing spell or just stabilize the downed enemy because they don't think they should be killed. They don't think that they deserve death and that causes conflict within the party. Interesting conflict, not toxic conflict. That's a different thing. But the same thing can apply to NPCs where, you know, let's say that one player and one NPC have a really meaningful relationship. They're at plus two, they're beloved using all the Strixhaven rules. And so that's interesting and compelling, but the rest of the NPC party doesn't feel the same way about the player character's party. And heck, even that NPC doesn't feel the same way about the uh, PC's fellow party members. Like, yeah, you're great, but your friends, I don't know them. They're kind of jerks. Um, so you can take that and turn it into something interesting when it comes time for those milestone conflicts to happen, where if fighting does break out between the rivals and the player characters, then this one particular NPC, you can play them to be conflicted or pulling their punches or something like that. And a perfect example is Captain America Civil War to pull the MCU into this. But when Black Widow and Hawkeye are fighting each other in the airport scene, and then Scarlet Witch comes in and is like, quit pulling your punches. That's exactly what I'm talking about here is, you know, you, you are on two sides of a conflict that you don't necessarily want to be on, but you have to fight each other. So all that to say, just avoid blanket generalizations when it comes to the attitude of an entire group of people towards your player characters. And you, you make this as complicated as you want to make it, honestly. If you want to keep it simple, nobody's going to begrudge you that. But if you want to add some nuance and some interesting bits, then look at each individual data point. And is there a negative two somewhere in there? Is there one rival NPC that really hates one of the player characters? And so they are going to potentially take an opportunity attack just to blow past the fighter to get to the wizard because they really don't like the wizard in the player character party. And also using role play to inform what those numbers mean also. Because obviously, zeros might mean that they don't interact. They don't have a relationship. They, they haven't interacted with each other. Or it could mean if the player character has role played and rolled some checks with a certain NPC and it has just failed to establish a meaningful relationship, but they've tried, they've talked, that's different than a zero where there just hasn't been any interaction. A zero in that is just, you know, yeah, we know each other, but we just, we can't find any common ground. There's no footing for a relationship to develop here. And so, yeah, you're a fellow adventurer and we're on the same weird path. So I have a begrudging respect for you, but you know, I, I care about my people more than I care about you. So that can be interesting, but much like if, if you are running a long-term campaign with story elements that you want to inject into the player characters' lives. If you want rival NPCs to be a meaningful part of your game, then you need to interject them into the player characters' lives. You can't just rely on the players to constantly go out of their way to touch base with the rival NPCs. Have them at the same shop that a PC goes to shop at. Have them also nearby on a side quest, even if it's not related to what the rival NPCs want. Maybe they're just hanging out nearby. They're in the street. It's like, oh, you spot them just on the corner. 
or they're on a they're on a side quest and they run into the player who's like, oh, hey, I wish I had time to talk, but I'm I'm chasing somebody right now, so I'll talk to you later. And they just take off running. That'd be such an interesting moment of like, as a player, to be like, I'm I'm gonna follow them. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm absolutely gonna take off after them to see what the heck is going on. So making them a vibrant part of your story to where the players are seeing them around and running into them and having opportunities to role play without the, it being put on the players to constantly seek out the NPCs to have meaningful role plays with them. And another big thing is remember that the rival NPCs are individual people. So there's an example in this book when the player characters are first meeting the rival NPCs where the actions of a player character will elicit opposite responses from the rival NPCs who are there, even though they're friends, but they just, they appreciate different things. It's basically you're at a festival and you have the option to cheat in one of the festival games. And you know, one of them, this person thinks that that's deplorable. Like how, how could you cheat? That's awful. I'm annoyed by you. And this one thinks pretty good. Good job. Like that's, that's pretty nice. Yeah. I, I wish I would have thought of that. So you have two different relationships off the bat based on whether or not you made that choice, which is interesting. And in the inverse, having an NPC run into multiple player characters at the same time, they should have different responses to those player characters based on where they're at in the relationship with them. That's interesting. And just because they have a certain opinion of one party member does not necessarily elevate all the other party members in their eyes. And that can be an interesting point of reflection. And then lastly, so at the end of this book comes the tipping point, obviously the final milestone where it's like put up, shut up. Like, are we friends? Are we enemies? What's going on? And that should also be a meaningful moment in your game. Even if you're not using call of the nether deep where, you know, you're going into the big, bad, evil fight and you should have that final touch point with the rival NPCs of like, where do they stand? What are they going to do? Are they going to help the player characters? Are they not? Are they going to try to actively impede the player characters? And there's so many different interesting places that you can take this, like have the player characters treated them so poorly that they have like thrown in with the big bad evil, or is it more of like a Paragon renegade mass effect type thing where the player characters just fall on one end of the spectrum and the rival NPCs find their methodology either abhorrent or naive. And so it's just like, you're going to screw this up and we won't stand by while you go in and do the, the right thing for the wrong reasons. Tons of different interesting things that you can do. But at this point, you could break up the rival NPC party based on their disparate relationships with the player characters. If you have had that beloved relationship for an entire campaign spanning years possibly of in-game time, then yeah, maybe at that point, that NPC has to make the call of like, who do I care about more? Like I've developed such a strong bond with this person who has consistently been on the opposite side of the street from me when it comes to like my relationships with my party members and like what we value and what we fight for and what we stand for. But I can't deny the fact that like I have this connection with this person and now that it's time for me to make a decision, what am I going to do? And they might break away from their rival party members. That would be an interesting and emotional moment. Just as interesting, perhaps even more emotional would be if they don't, if they have to look at the player character and say, I'm sorry, but just like you look at the people who stand around you, who have fought beside you this whole time, who have stood up for you, that's how I feel about them. And I can't turn my back on them. So I'm sorry. And that could be so interesting and cool. And just the exact opposite also of if the rival party overall has a friendly relationship with the player characters party, but there's one person who has a negative two with a PC member. And it's been that way for so long. And they're just flabbergasted by their companions. Like, what are you talk? How can you want to help them? How can you want to stand by them at a time like this? And they could walk away from their party members. They could betray their party members. They could, they could have thrown in and been a spy 
And so there's just so many interesting things that you can do with the rival system. And I'd love it in this book. So yeah, that's, that's kind of the, the final moments of the rival system is how, how does it all shake out? How have these relationships had a lasting impact on all of the NPCs and hopefully all of the player characters. And I mean, guy, could you imagine a player character deciding that they need to go stand with the rival NPCs? Because maybe, maybe just roleplay hasn't worked out well with that particular player character with the rest of the party. And they've never really felt as ingratiated and welcomed and had those meaningful moments. But you know who they have had that with? The rival NPCs. And, oh, could you imagine, like, the the end of a campaign and one party member just walks over to side with the rivals. Like, that would be wild and insane and memorable. So there's so many things that you can do with a rival NPC system. I love that they introduced it the way they did in Call the Nether Deep. Yes, it is a bare bones framework as it is presented in the book. But hopefully, I've kind of laid out how you can take that framework and build upon it to where it be can become something really meaningful and engaging and impactful in your games. Let me know what you thought down in the comments below. Thank you all so much for watching. Be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and I will see you next time.